Hey there, Calc 3 folks, back here with another lecture uh, in our study of multiple integration where uh, in this video I want to spend some time with you uh, looking at the case for triple integrals in the cylindrical coordinate system, right? And setting up a triple integral within the context of uh, cylindrical coordinates, right? And what we do open up with here uh, is introducing ourselves to the cylindrical coordinate system. And I, I will take note to begin with here that it, it, it's, it really is not much new to us in terms of how we define location in space. It is kind of a mix between our understanding of position in two-dimensional space defined by our uh, polar descriptions of position in two dimensions uh, with that component for the third dimension uh, still happening in the rectangular context, still happening with respect to uh, the value of z uh, in our uh, description of three-dimensional space, right? Uh, what we do begin by noting here though, right, uh, in addition to defining location by the coordinate x comma y comma z in three-dimensional space, we can denote that coordinate's location actually by using the coordinate r comma theta comma z, right? Where I began by highlighting that when we think about this coordinate in three dimensions, the values of r and theta, right, are just our descriptions of position in two-dimensional space using what we call polar coordinates. All right, and polar coordinates are not a new topic for us, folks. We've uh, been studying polar coordinates back since uh, chapter uh, 12. We're introduced to polar coordinates, I do recall. And um, we also saw polar coordinates develop just a few sections ago when we were looking at calculating double integrals over polar regions. All right, uh, we're going to see that idea kind of extend itself now up. Uh, to help us out here in three-dimensional space, right? Uh, where? Ooh, I should really say, I think that's R2 there. I'll have to double back and check. Uh, using the polar coordinates R comma theta in this rectangular region here. Now, what is R and theta? Again, we could, or what is a cylindrical coordinate? Let's take note here with a bit of an illustration, right? We might consider the, the following illustration of the cylindrical coordinate given by r comma theta comma z, where r, theta, and z are uh, illustrated by these arbitrary quantities, r1, theta1, and z1, all right? That coordinate r comma theta, denoted by r1 comma theta1 in this description of position, right, does describe uh, a location in two-dimensional space as a set of polar coordinates, and z equal to z1, right? This value z equal to z1 describes a location that occurs along the z-axis, right? And down below here, you do see I, I give you a bit of an illustration for this scenario. Here at this location in our picture, right? Uh, that At that location, there is our coordinate r1 theta 1 comma z1. It is located in this three-dimensional space where instead of denoting it at some x, y, z coordinate, we denote it at some r theta comma z coordinate, all right? Where r and theta are this description that's occurring down here in two-dimensional space that describes this location in that xy plane, right? At In the xy plane, the location for this coordinate would correspond to being located at r1 comma theta1, the z1 being equal to zero, right? Where r1 and theta1, right, describe these measurements with respect to this coordinate, these measurements being uh, if we were to place a radial arm in the xy plane from the origin of the system through this coordinate at r1 comma theta1, 
that radial arm would form an angle with the positive x-axis that would measure theta 1 units in length, right? Or in theta 1 units in radians, we should say. And R1, right, would mark a distance along that radial arm from that location to the origin, all right? And I do illustrate these here as these red dashed lines in this uh, what uh, illustration down here in this xy plane in two dimensional space. How we obtain the location then in three dimensions relative to this location in two is we go up or down whatever happens to be our description of z1. And here we can see that we are traveling uh, directly up uh, what we might say is orthogonal to the xy plane, right? Um, a distance of z1 units, a distance of z1 that corresponds to traveling up so many units along the z-axis. All right. What's different in a cylindrical coordinate as composed to, as opposed to an xyz coordinate in rectangular space is the use of r1 and theta1 to describe this location in two dimensions. All right. Z maintains its understanding here in the coordinate, uh, cylindrical coordinate system. It doesn't change, right? It's still part of the cylindrical coordinate system, right? Let's see what I make note of next here. Oh, what we make note of next then is how do we go about calculating, right, a triple integral, right, over region D for function F with respect to the volume of D within the context of the cylindrical coordinate system. And as we had seen back in uh, double integrals over polar regions, there are uh, there is an approach we can take, uh, but it is going to require some transformation into a particular format. And we see that develop again here in uh, this case of the uh, triple integral in the context of cylindrical coordinates. Now, how I present this is in theor theorem form. So if we look at this theorem, right, it looks rather familiar. Here we are going to assume f is going to be this multivariable function that is continuous over this region D that's occurring in three-dimensional space. Right? This is the region over which we're going to be finding the triple integral right? with respect to the volume of that uh, region right? in three-dimensional space. Where here, if we describe D, that region, using instead of rectangular coordinates, we use uh, the uh, cylindrical coordinates R comma theta comma Z, right? where we put on what looked to be very similar restrictions to what we had in polar regions, theta being be bounded by angles between alpha and beta, and r being bounded between polar functions of theta, g of theta, and h of theta. And now, in the uh, three-dimensional context, incorporate just our description of z, where here's z again, right? most likely is going to be described as some function within the context of x and y. All right? And if d is described in this manner, and we consider calculating this triple integral right, over that region of d for a multivariable function in terms of x, y, and z with respect to the volume of d, right? Since x equals r cosine theta and y would be equal to r sine theta, that triple integral that we could start off with in terms of x and y, well, x, y, and z, that happens with respect to the volume of d, right, could be translated into this triple integration here on the right-hand side. Where you will notice the order of integration is dz dr d theta, Right? The outer integration happening with respect to theta across the bounds from alpha to beta. The middle integration happening with respect to those functions of theta, g of theta and h of theta, right? happening across the bounds from g of theta up to h of theta. 
where these first two bounds should look familiar when we go back to and, and, and uh, consider the case again for double integrals over polar regions. These were the two integrals that we saw in the specific case of uh, a double integral over a polar region. All right? The double integrals, or the two integrals in that double integral took on exactly this form and had a description of R that was exactly as we had seen uh, develop here to begin our description of, of the constraints on D. All right? What we do consider having, though, in this case is an additional iteration of integration Right? This innermost integration that's actually going to happen with respect to Z. Now, as we noted in D, Z will typically be defined as some function in terms of X and Y, where you're going to have to take note because X is equal to R cosine theta and Y is equal to R sine theta, you can come back to these functions in terms of X and Y, function M and function N, and replace right? Be able to replace uh, x and y in those functions, right? With respect to x, well, with respect to r and theta by making r equal to cosine theta and, oh, sorry, x equal to r cosine theta and y equal to r sine theta. Now, I do see a, a quick ear in my notes here. I want to change around these bounds in order to be accurate. Move it out here. Right? If as z is going from M to N, then M has to be our lower bound and N has to be our upper. And I have to get those in the proper order, just like I had here for the bounds on R and our bounds on theta. Make sure I have those in the right order. Now, if we move into the integrand, you will notice the difference here in our integrand, right? To begin with, you'll notice function F, instead of it being stated in terms of X, Y, and Z, X is being replaced with R cosine theta, y is being replaced with r sine theta, and z, well, z just remains the variable z in the functional description of f. But you do have to also replace this x and this y in our functional description of f with respect to these values in terms of r and theta, r cosine theta and r sine theta, respectively. And then also, as we had seen back in the case for double integration over polar regions, we are going to have to include one additional factor, right, into this integrand, that factor of R, right? That R comes along with transforming the variables X and Y and their differentials, their change in X and Y, right, with respect to now changes in terms of R and theta, right? DX, DY in a change of variables will always become the values r, d, r, d, theta. So we can see r, d, r, d, theta now as part of our integration here, right? The r becoming a factor into our integrand, right? Other than that, it's not too much of a difference in calculation, folks, right? Uh, a triple integration is an iterative integration. Right? And we will see that happen in our examples. We just have to make sure that we translate right, a triple integral that's happening in the cylindrical context into an integration that's strictly in terms of Z. Z isn't going to have to transform, but also involving R and theta, where X and Y have to be replaced with these uh, terms, in, well, these values in terms of R and theta. All right? Let's look at an example. If I bring this example up in the view, right, consider calculating this triple integral here. All right. What you will notice, uh, first of all, this triple integral has a rather simplistic integrand. This is has an integrand of just the value of 1 here. And we are integrating with respect to our... Uh, Variables dz, dy, dx, uh, we are integrating in the rectangular coordinate system. This is an integration that presents itself uh, in the rectangular context, in the Cartesian context here, folks, right? Where we are considering x changing across these bounds from negative 4 to 4, y changing 
across these bounds defined as functions of x from negative square root of 16 minus x squared to positive square root of 16 minus x squared. And where z is changing across these uh, functional bounds in terms of x and y from the square root of x squared plus y squared up to this constant function of 4. All right. Um, we are calculating this integral over an integrand of 1 where not only does this then represent a, a hypernet area trapped between uh, this surface in three-dimensional space and, well, I should say between this surface in four-dimensional space, this hypersurface, and this three-dimensional solid described by D, it also cor corresponds to what's going to be the volume of the solid D here since our integrand is the value of 1. So we really are doing just a volume calculation. Also, folks, a volume described by this solid of D. And to be honest with you, how we are going to approach these triple integrals, in most cases, to develop the uh, cylindrical context, is we are going to have to, in a sense, decipher, right, our description of D, right, sometimes presented in a rectangular description as we see here, into a description that happens in the cylindrical coordinate system. All right? Now, if I take this description of boundaries here, we will notice right, the bounds here indicated in this triple integral, right? described in rectangular regions have a graph that is illustrated as follows. All right? We are looking at x being between the values negative 4 and 4, y being between these functional descriptions of x, and z being between these multivariable functions of x and y. One of them given by the square root of x squared plus y squared, the other given by this constant function. All right? And what those do describe, folks, is this region of space, right? The region of space seen here in this illustration. Now, it's a little blurry when I blew it up here, but hopefully it'll show up fine on your printouts, folks. But uh, what we do see happening here is, again, x is varying from negative 4 to 4, right? So we see it varying across those constant bounds from negative 4 to 4. Y is varying across bounds described by the upper and lower half of a circle. This describes the upper half of a circle with radius 4. And we see that described here as the upper half of our circle of radius 4. And y is also defined its lower half, right? Uh, it's, it's bottom half defined by, well, r's bottom half defined by this uh, half a circle, the semicircle from neg uh, given by negative square root of 16 minus x squared, right? This circle centered at the origin with a radius of 4 that forms down here in this negative region for values of y. And more so, we can actually, if we broke down our descriptions of y, I do think I'd follow with that, right? These are, in a sense, occurring, right? What we are describing is this picture here, right? X happening between these bounds from negative 4 to 4, Y being bounded by the square root of 16 minus X squared, the upper half of this circle, from above, and Y being bounded below from the lower half of this circle here of radius 4, right? That is the description we have here for Y, where then Z, what describes Z's behavior, is z falls between this surface, where what this surface describes, folks, is the uh, what we might call the lateral edge, uh, the lateral edge of this cone, right, or the lateral face of this cone, right. It is this conical surface that forms, right. That conical surface, right is described by this description of z in terms of x and y. As x and y spread out from the origin over region r, 
right? Z goes up in value in a very much linear behavior that forms this conical shape. And this cone continues up until Z reaches what value? Until it's, it's capped off by the surface at a value of Z equal to four. And that's what we see on the upper half here, right? We are really taking a slice of this cone then from four down to our XY plane, and it's all happening over this region of R. All right. So in this uh, breakdown, a lot of this is going to begin by being able to decipher this description of your region D in the rectangular system so that you can translate that over to what uh, we're going to now describe in the cylindrical system. And really what we're going to have to consider transforming here, folks, the notice the Z values, you, you really leave those alone. We are going to have to rewrite X and Y in terms of R and theta which you notice isn't going to be too tricky because x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. And the square root of r squared is simply the value of r. But we're going to have to translate this description of r in terms of r and theta. And actually, that's not too tricky of a description. You, you may have gotten a hint of it down here, right, as I set this up, right? But let's take note here. Uh, in the illustration... Let me uh, actually do this. Did I really? Okay. We'll have to shrink this down. Get this back down to a, a not so fuzzy size. There we go. All right. So, note in this illustration, solid D, this region D occurring in R3, right, occurs over a region of R in two dimensional space, also illustrated here in the graph, where in the polar context, Region R could actually be described as this. All right? If we brought that picture back into view, all right? That description of R, all right? Can be described in the polar context with respect to variables R and theta, where theta is this angle forming between the positive x-axis and points throughout this space that occur everywhere from zero all the way around this circular region through one cycle up to the value of two pi, right? And R, the distance we are from the origin as we cycle around this circle, starting at zero and up through values of theta equal to two pi, are always between a radius distance, a distance of zero at the origin, going up to a distance of four units away. All right? And we get a very simplistic description of R compared to what we had back here in the case of the rectangular coordinate system. All right? We're going to use this description of R in our triple integral. We bring the triple integral, I believe, up in the picture, right? Or to begin with. So it follows that region D can also be defined as this. This what uh, set of points in three-dimensional space described by the coordinates R comma theta comma Z, such that now theta is bounded by these values from 0 to 2 pi, right? coming out of this description of region R, intersected with the values of R coming from our description of R that are bounded between the constants of 0 and 4, right? intersected with now values of Z, where if we go back to our three-dimensional picture, are happening on the up, bounded between on the upper end by this surface where Z equals 4, the uh, top plane of this cone down to the actual surface that forms the cone, the lateral surface here on the cone, all right? Uh, all the Z values trapped over region R between these two surfaces form the solid D over which we're integrating. And in the cylindrical context, we can describe the D as we see here, right? That region D as, as we see here with respect to these bounds. A lot like how we see our theorem presented, right? 
assume we have this function f now, right, which is just constant function f, and it is continuous over this region d now that has been set up partially with respect to the polar coordinate system and partially with respect to the rectangular coordinate system where z maintains its description in the cylindrical system here, right? When we mix these two systems in the manner that we do here to describe three-dimensional space and location in three dimensions, we are describing things in the cylindrical coordinate system, right? Where now, when we go to set up our integral for the triple integral in this case, right? We're going to have to set it up with a very specific order. It is going to have to be set up very specifically with respect to the order dz dr d theta. Where dr d theta describes that polar region r in two dimensions that we should be familiar with from our double integrals over region r. Right? Where our then inner integral then happens with respect to z, where in the rectangular system between m and n, our integration will occur, but will have to be rewritten so that x equals r cosine theta and y equals r sine theta. Right? And then as for our integrand goes, we do have a rather simple integrand. Our function f in this case, if we look down below again, is just equal to the val argument of 1 right? It's just equal to this argument of 1, so uh, replacing our, our x and y with these uh, values in terms of r and theta is still just going to leave behind 1, but because we are doing this variable transformation with respect to x and y, we are going to have to include this additional factor in our, in our integrand, the value of r. We will have 1 times r in our integrand, right? If I bring that into view, right, we now think about our double integral. It will happen across this description of dr and d theta. Theta from 0 to 2 pi and the outermost integral. R, the middle integral between values of 0 and 4. Z does get rewritten where I replace x squared plus y squared with r squared in our polar relationships. Right? And the square root of r squared just simplifies to r, and our upper bound 4, well, that still remains a constant of 4 in the polar context. Right? And as we had noted, that old integrand that used to be here, right, the old integrand of 1, now just simply has to include the factor of r in it. So it would be 1 times r, which would just yield the integrand of r. And we begin our integration with respect to variable z. And r by itself is a constant, so the antiderivative of r with respect to z is just rz, which we're going to evaluate across the bounds from r to 4. Right? And if we set this up right, following from the calculations, you, we're really just going to use an iterative out integration process here, right? Starting with this inner integral, the antiderivative of r is rz, which we evaluate across the bounds from r to 4. At 4, it's 4r. At r, it's r squared. So it's 4 minus r squared here. If we bring that result into view, that would give us then this double integral calculation. Where now we're going to integrate with respect to r, so this will become 2r squared, bump it up by a power and divide by 2, bump it up to 2 and divide by 2, and here we would bump this power of r up to 3 and divide by 3. So this would be 2r minus 1 third r cubed, and we would evaluate that across the bounds from 0 to 4. Now it does leave us a polynomial result in terms of r, so at 0, it all zeroes away, right? But at 4, this is going to be... Um, 16 times 2 is 32, minus this would result in 64 thirds. Well, 32 written with a common denominator of 3 would be 96 thirds, minus 64 thirds would yield 32 thirds in the evaluation of that antiderivative across those bounds. 
So what we end up having, what we finish up here, is that integrand from zero to four for these this 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 uh, antiderivative would result in thirty two thirds. 96 thirds minus 64 thirds is 32 thirds, which we now evaluate with respect to theta. And this is just a constant with respect to theta. So now that would become 32 theta, 32 thirds of theta, that where the theta has to be evaluated across the bounds from 0 to 2 pi. And at 2 pi, well, at 0, it's 0, and at 2 pi, it's 64 pi over 3. So the value of the triple integral, if we were to in interpret it in its uh, hypernet volume interpretation, it would be 64 pi thirds units to the fourth power. Or if we were to interpret it as this uh, volume of our solid D, it would be uh, 64 pi over 3 units cubed in volume. And, and either one of those would be acceptable. And in fact, I imagine if we went back and we used the volume formula for a, um, a cone, right, with this particular description, as, as we see here in this graph, we would come up with a very, well, we would come up with an equivalent value, 64 pi over 3 units cubed. All right. Now, folks, that is triple integrals in the cylindrical coordinate system. All right? You are going to have to interpret your solid D in terms of the cylindrical system, which does involve interpreting the R, uh, R's description in D, right, uh, in terms of the polar system. And when approaching the triple integral, Everywhere that you have x and y remain in your multivariable function and in your bounds on z, you will have to replace the x with r cosine theta and the y with r sine theta. Right? And your order of integration will very specifically happen in the order dz, dr, d theta, where when we transform the variables dx, dy into dr, d theta, we do need to incorporate this extra <coughs> excuse me, uh, multiplying factor there, or scaling factor in our integrand. That factor is actually known as the Jacobian, right? Uh, we did see it uh, and, and take note of it back in uh, double integrals over polar regions. We had referred to it as the Jacobian. And if we, again, have time, I'll come back and show you how that develops here uh, at the end of this chapter. I think we're only a section or so away from there. Uh, so hopefully we got enough time, I think I do, to, to, to present that to you, All right? But that would be the Jacobian factor. You want to make sure that you include that in our calculation. And we did that here. This argument of 1, right, we just had to multiply it by r in our calculation. If I had some other functional description of f in terms of x and y, I would have to replace the x with r cosine theta, the y with r sine theta, and anywhere I saw things like x squared plus y squared, I could also replace that with r squared if need be. All right? And my integration then would have to happen in this very specific order. All right? uh, folks, we will likely in a few more examples see uh, some more triple integrals occur in cylindrical coordinates. So uh, I am going to finish there with this uh, lecture. All right? Um, what I do want to maybe try to do for you folks, and I've been promising this, and I've got to come back and, and do this. Um, I want to put together a mathematical, a mathematical lab for your demo that'll show you how to sketch out these regions. And it's, it's not that tricky, right? It does use a very specific plot command in our, well, in Mathematica. Uh, and, I can sh and that plot command that we use is very similar to what we have up here in our, in our description of D. Right. In fact, this is almost directly translated over into uh, what would be our Mathematica command in this problem. All right. I do see one other error up in here. Let me fix that. All right. So uh, I do want to show you that. And similarly for R, if we wanted to come up with some description of R, uh, we could use this description of X and Y to produce some description of R in two-dimensional space. And I'll, I'll show you how to maybe set some of those plots up and maybe give you just a, a general overall 
plotting demo in uh, Mathematica. Um, certainly, like I said, Mathematica is a, something we, we maybe want to make sure that we are uh, beginning to learn how to use. So, uh, a demo might do you folks some good. So, I'll see what I can do here uh, with that maybe being uh, some of the uh, beginnings of my next lecture here. Uh, with that said, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you're hanging in there. I hope you're all coping with this. And, um, well, you know, I'm hanging in there the best I can, too. I'm keeping myself busy with making these videos for you. I hope you're keeping yourself busy with watching them. And I hope it makes you feel a little normal, right? Even though this is quite abnormal to what you might be used to, folks. I, I, after a month, it is all starting to feel rather normal again as as our, our, our sense of normalcy changes, which is, I hope, not permanent. Uh, and I know it's not going to be permanent. Uh, we will see, right, folks? So, uh, with that said, I'll stop there, and uh, hopefully I'll be back with another demo video for you, is my plans. All right, folks, take it easy. See you next time. Later.